good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on um, Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available um, later for you to watch at your convenience. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to any, for anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the um, shows that we have on Encompass Live. For those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, so we are similar to your state library. Uh, so we provide services and training and resources and grants to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, um, schools, corrections, museums, um, anything and everything. Um, really our only criteria also is something to do with libraries. Um, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Um, on the last Wednesday of every month, it is Pretty Sweet Tech Day, yay! <laughs> Which is when Amanda Sweet, who is our uh, technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, she comes on the show to talk to us about um, anything techie related, more tech focus. We sometimes have tech related things on other 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 ways that Wednesdays too, but you can always depend on the last Wednesday of the month will always be something techie from Amanda. And today we she has arranged uh, for us to have a guest speaker actually with us. And um, so I will just hand it over to you, Amanda, Sarah, to um, intro, do your thing. Amanda, explain how you know you saw this session elsewhere and brought we brought it here, et cetera. Yeah. So I actually saw this session at the Internet Librarian Conference, and that was, was it in October? October, it's usually October. Yeah. October, yeah. Occasionally my conference months blur, so <laughs> be lucky I remembered which month. <laughs> it's impressive, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But I loved all things Makerspace, and she had some like great awesome insights into makerspace goodness and mm -hmm. i also have been kind of following the nation of makers thing and i've been so that's also kind of like how i know about sarah so <laughs> i will turn it over to sarah to talk about all things makerspace <laughs> Awesome. I'm so excited to be here and I really appreciate you reaching out, Amanda. Um, and I'm glad that we crossed paths at Internet Librarian and next year we'll have to, um, yeah, get together now that we know each other. And we both have innovation in our job title, which like just makes us obviously best friends. So, um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about makerspaces as hubs for interdisciplinary learning. This presentation is primarily aimed at academic library makerspaces because we talk a lot I'll be talking a lot about information literacy and the ACRL framework for information literacy um, but I hope that it can be interesting to anybody who does makerspace programming workshops classes because uh, it gets a little bit at the theory and the intention behind why we do makerspaces and maker-centered learning so that's what I'll be doing today. I guess um, I'll start by kind of introducing myself and like where I come from. So uh, right now I'm creation and innovation services librarian at Miami University. It's in Ohio, not Florida. And um, I have but about eight years. It's still gonna be like some warm temperatures It's gonna today. be 69 degrees today. Um, but it is gonna be raining all day, but yeah, way better. I, it sounds like you all have it not so good today. So sorry about that, Nebraska. <laughs> but yeah, so I am in Ohio, not Florida. Um, so I started my career in public libraries at Pikes Peak Library District in Colorado, where I ran makerspace programming at a busy main library that had two makerspaces, and then eventually at, um, did programming for all 15 locations um, in that district. 
So I came to Miami in 2018, and along with colleagues in my department here, we opened the makerspace at King Library in uh, fall of 2019. And that's what I do. I run that space. And in addition to managing the makerspace, I work with faculty. And I, my goal is to incorporate maker literacy into courses of basically any discipline. And I see maker literacy as a tool for learning and a tool for helping faculty get their students to engage differently with content and, and um, find meaning in various ways. And I've worked with a bunch of different disciplines so far, English, history, chemistry, art, fashion design, Spanish and Portuguese, entrepreneurship, Latin American studies, and I hope to keep growing that kind of repertoire of maker-centered learning. So again, today I'm going to be talking about maker literacy and how it connects to the ACRL framework. And I have a little um, outline of what I want to cover today. I'm going to introduce a couple of the influential maker-centered learning frameworks that are out there, both in kind of K through 12 environments and higher education. And then I'm going to dive a little bit into some more theoretical concepts, I guess. Um, we're going to talk about meta-literacy and liminality and how those can be bridges between maker-centered learning and traditional information literacy instruction in academic libraries. Then I'll share some of my maker literacy student learning outcomes that I've been working on for the last couple of years. And finally, I'm gonna um, show some examples of instruction that I have really enjoyed doing. And then I hope to answer your questions at the end or hear from you um, in whatever way you'd like. So let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, I'll encourage everyone, whenever you have a question or something you want more clarification on, just go ahead and type it right into the questions section when you think about it. Don't want anybody to forget anything you wanted to ask, and I will um, relay that um, as they come yeah. up. And Krista, yeah, if anything comes up that's like a question about what I'm talking about currently, please feel mm -hmm. free to interrupt me with questions. Absolutely. Um, I'm yeah. good at interrupting. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is, uh, I just want to give you some context of like my what my space is and what we do here. So it's the makerspace at King. King Library is our large main library here on Miami's campus. Miami University is a mid-sized um, liberal arts college or university, and we have about 20,000 students. So it gets, gives you an idea of, um, you know, kind of who we serve. We're an experiential learning space, and our mission is to show everyone at Miami, students, faculty, and staff that they can be a maker and that they're included in this you know maker movement maker community and empower them to create whatever their heart desires we do have a bunch of equipment most of it we've purchased through internal grant funding uh, so we've been lucky with with grants for like the past four years so we have things like 3d printers we have laser cutters uh, silhouette vinyl cutters we have a big sewing and embroidery and basically textile arts area. We have virtual reality, AV recording, and more, just all sorts of tools and things like that. But that being said, I always like to point out that uh, the tools don't make the makerspace. It's really the people and the connections and the engagement that happens in the space. So if you are in a position in a library where you, you aren't in a position to purchase you know this equipment yet like you you know you maybe don't have the funding for it or whatever i encourage you to still try to uh incorporate some of this maker centered learning through low tech making and um so a lot of my classes we do prototyping using things like popsicle sticks and pipe cleaners and rubber bands and you know things like that and we do all that before they ever get to the um, machinery so uh, really, it's about the community that comes into the space, about the fact that we are, since we're the, the library on campus, we're open to everyone. So we really are kind of a mishmash of students of different majors, years, interests, backgrounds, and also, you know, mingling with faculty and staff in the space. So um, it's, yeah, it's all about that that community really, and not as much about the equipment. The equipment is nice in terms of like getting people's interest and kind of, you know, different ways to engage, but I just really like to, to emphasize that people are the most important thing about our space. So that's basically what we are, what we do. 
now we're going to kind of dive into um, yeah some of this uh, theory and the the why behind it. So we know uh, anybody in libraries knows that maker spaces have become more popular in all types of libraries. And I would say most recently in academic libraries, I think public libraries really paved the way and um, academic libraries are kind of jumping on the bandwagon too. And uh, like I said, on college campuses, the library is a really great place to house the makerspace because we're open to everyone. We're generally in a centralized location that's accessible to everyone. And we generally also have an, a hand in instruction for all different disciplines. And um, so it's really great it's a great place to have this collaborative transdisciplinary space. And um, it's, you know, I personally obviously really think that maker spaces are timeless, but we know that innovation in libraries, in higher education, it moves quickly. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that maker spaces don't become some kind of passing fad. I truly don't think they will be, but I think it's important for us to always um, find ways to connect what we do with maker spaces to our missions, uh, to our library missions. So this presentation is kind of about that. It's about connecting maker spaces to the instructional mission of academic libraries. And I argue that um, we can do that through the ACRO framework for information literacy and through some of the foundational concepts of that framework. So I think the vast possibilities for student learning and engagement are what is going to keep maker spaces relevant as we go forward and you know new technology arises new fads arise whatever so that's the why behind this kind of connection that i'm making all right i would like to introduce a couple of influential maker-centered learning frameworks the first one is agency by design this is uh, out of the harvard graduate school of education and it's an initiative called project zero and it focused on k-12 through education but it, um, its whole purpose was to, uh, quote, investigate the promises, practices, and pedagogies of maker-centered learning experiences. So it was a multi-year longitudinal study of a bunch of K through 12 students who were doing makerspace activities. So their framework that they've come up with has to do with these two circles that you see here on the left side. So this inner circle is sensitivity to design. And the, the things in the very middle are what they call thinking routines. And they're just ways of having students engage in making that cause them to look closely, explore complexity, find opportunity. And the whole idea is that they'll develop this sensitivity to design. And that means that students start looking at the designed things around them. So for instance, if you're sitting in your office or you're sitting at home or wherever, just look around you at all the stuff around you. Like every single thing is, unless it's like a plant, I guess, <laughs> but almost every single thing was designed by a person. So like this tissue box somebody designed, uh, this nail file somebody designed, um, everything. So it, it prompts students to start number one, recognizing that and not taking any of that stuff for granted, because it's very easy for us to do that because it's just so ingrained in our lives. But students through making kind of develop the sensitivity to the design things around them. And they start to recognize somebody had to think about that. Somebody had to make that and test that. And once that happens, it helps them uh, start to realize that maybe they can actually uh, tinker with things on their own and maybe they can uh, you know take a designed object and break it apart and figure out how it works or maybe they can uh, try to improve upon it and then maybe eventually they can even make their own designed objects so it's a very kind of like powerful um, mindset development and then it's wrapped up in this idea of maker empowerment which is that bigger circle and so this empowerment essentially um, allows students to kind of understand the designed objects and systems around them and develop this idea of what agency by, by design calls self-competence. And it's kind of different from self-confidence. Self-competence is this conviction that you can 
design things, you can tinker with things, you can try new things and fail and move past it and grow your skills and eventually just make a big difference in the world through that. So I I love the agency by design framework. Like I said, it, it focused on K through 12 learning, but I've actually used a lot of their thinking routines and just theory in what I do with college students. And it's I think a lot of it is transferable and a lot of it could also be transferable to informal learning environments in like public libraries, for instance. So. Um, so that's agency by design. And then this other project is called the Maker Literacies Project, and it's from higher education. It was developed by Martin Wallace, who was the Maker Literacies Librarian at the University of Texas Arlington. And it, it started there as a pilot project, and then it grew to um, be a national initiative funded by an IMLS grant, where five other universities across the country worked on and refined these competencies and created lesson plans. And they're still working on it. Um, if you just search Maker Literacies Project, you'll find their website. It has a bunch of great lesson plans and information and everything. But if we look at this chart, in my opinion, the most important things are under um, the share category. So we see things like applying knowledge gained into other disciplines, workforce, and community, being mindful of the spectrum of cultural, economic, environmental, and social issues surrounding making, understanding the legal issues surrounding making, and finally, pursuing entrepreneurial opportunities. So this to me shows a similar thing to what we're seeing with agency by design, where students are learning all of these transferable skills and they are using it to uh, go out into the world and do great things. And it's definitely the benefits of these frameworks and the benefits of maker literacy, in my opinion, are not necessarily the like hard skills that students are learning. So they do come in and they learn 3D printing or, or CAD modeling or vector design um, or whatever, but that technology is always going to change, maybe by the time they even get into the workforce. So what's more important are these kind of transdisciplinary uh, soft skills or, or mindsets that kind of really stick with students. Uh, and then I also wanted to share, oh, did we have a question? I know that I use like the maker literacies even for just community education for entrepreneurs and businesses like it's everywhere right now yeah exactly yeah so i think both of those frameworks are super transferable like definitely yeah, yeah. it's not that i definitely wouldn't put them in a box of you know just being for a certain group of people yeah. um yeah so anyway, I wanted to share this maker instruction toolkit. This is by Stephanie Milne Lane and Amy Vecchioni. I hope I said that name correctly, uh, but it's from the Boise State Maker Lab. They have uh, some great resources. I recommend you check it out. And I'll, um, I believe Krista can share my slides after the fact, and I have links on the slides. So uh, if you wanna access any of these resources, there's links on every slide that you could do Totally recommend taking a look at this. So yes, uh, yes. a little. After, yeah, after the show with the archive page, we'll have a link out to um, Sarah's slides. So don't try to scribble down all these URLs or anything. You'll have all, <laughs> You'll have all that yeah. available. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, great. So uh, this toolkit has been really influential for me. And I'll just give a little context, I guess. So I mentioned that I worked in public libraries and then came into academic libraries. I, in public libraries, really recognized the benefits of maker-centered learning, um, but when I came to an academic library, I kind of struggled with contextualizing these amazing learning outcomes that I knew were achieved through making with the um, instructional goals of the library that I came into, which was very information literacy focused and very heavily influenced by the ACRL framework. So, um, and maybe I should put a little caveat in here because I know when I was presenting this at Internet Librarian, um, someone from a public library asked what what is the ACRL framework? <laughs> so for anybody who's not in academic libraries, it's not something that would necessarily be on your radar. So I'll just, 
very quickly um, say that it is uh, basically a widely accepted framework for teaching information literacy, and it has, um, what is it, eight frames, six frames? Right now I'm blanking on how many frames it has, but for each frame, it has um, threshold concepts and dispositions, and it essentially, each, with all the frames, it covers all the different aspects of information literacy. So if you wanna um, look into it more, definitely uh, just Google ACRL framework for information literacy and you can read the whole document. But I'll talk about it a lot in this presentation. So I figured I would go ahead and give a little explanation for those of you who might not be in academic libraries or have worked in this area. So anyway, um, so when I first came into my position here at Miami, I was like, does maker literacy even fit with like information literacy? Like what, like, and I really struggled with it until I came across this toolkit. And um, you'll notice they have this section called matching the maker lab with the ACRL framework. And it uh, kind of, made me step back and like realize that actually if you look at the foundational concepts of the ACRL framework, uh, maker literacy does make sense. It does fit in there. So once I went in that direction, I discovered these concepts of meta literacy and liminality. And um, that's kind of a driving force behind a lot of this presentation. So uh, definitely have to give props to Stephanie and Amy for putting together this amazing toolkit. They also have like uh, lesson plans and uh, like instruction checklists and example classes. So it's a really great resource. So anyway, that's what led me down this kind of theoretical track, I guess, that I'm on. Uh, so I wanted to go into some of these concepts and then talk about how it connects to maker literacy. The first concept is meta literacy. This is um, something that was originally introduced by Thomas Mackey and Trudy Jacobson in 2011. And it puts emphasis on students as consumers, or not consumers, but creators of information and empowers them to collaborate successfully with others. So it was originally developed as a uh, framework for uh, helping students navigate literacies, including new technologies that, you know, were coming out. And um, so it's been interpreted by a lot of librarians and scholars. There are four books on meta literacy and a bunch of articles, but um, it basically moves away from the idea that information literacy is just a just some skills that you check off. And instead it focuses on mindset development, which sounds familiar, because that's what we were just talking about with maker literacy. And uh, the mindset is more important than individual skill acquisition. And the elements of it are empowerment, creation over consumption, civic mindedness, and metacognition. So I'm gonna talk about each one of those and how it connects to, how I believe it connects to maker literacy. So let's talk about this idea of student empowerment. Um, it is an important as aspect of meta literacy. It's um, in the 2018 Meta Literate Learning Roles by Jacobs, Jacobson, Mackey, and O'Brien. It, um, it talks about how empowerment allows students to step into different roles and it allows them to kind of question the power structures around information and information creation and basically develop their own ideas about information creation so that they can be um, fluent uh, empowered scholars, you know, who can um, analyze information, understand authority, and feel comfortable creating things on their own. And this actually, obviously, student empowerment is very core to maker literacy. When we looked at those frameworks, we talked a lot about empowerment. And Edward Clapp, who is one of the, um, who is actually the lead on the Agency by Design project, um, talks about how um, students become empowered to kind of understand those design dimensions around them, but to tinker and improve on those things as well. So it's all about this idea of empowerment and becoming active tinkerers and creators. So I think that connects really well with this empowerment idea um, that we see in the meta-literacy literature. 
And then we have this idea of consumer to creator. Uh, so the 2018 meta literacy goals and learning objectives, they uh, sort meta literate learning into four domains behavioral, cognitive, affective, and metacognitive. And goal three of these is to produce and share information in collaborative and participatory environments. And this involves seeing oneself as a producer as well as a consumer of information and also learning to conscientiously and ethically um, participate in collaborative environments. So if we look at how that lines up with maker literacy, uh, the maker movement's ethos is very much create, don't consume. And it, like we were talking about, it impacts students' worldview and leads them to have this creator mindset and not just blindly accept, you know, uh, the design things around us and instead um, maybe try to make their own instead or maybe try to fix things instead of buying a new one because I know a lot of our um, a lot of the things around us and a lot of our um, products that we purchase are very much meant to be single use or meant to be um, you know replaced every couple of years so this whole mindset helps students um, kind of push against that a little bit. And instead of just consuming things, you know, become empowered creators. That is one then, of my favorite parts. Yeah, yeah I know, yeah. it's awesome. Um, and that just kind of naturally leads to this idea of civic mindedness. So this is one of the meta literate learning characteristics. It is um, using things that they've learned in the classroom to actually go out and improve their communities in the world. And it's kind of a natural byproduct of that, that idea of maker empowerment because uh, students, and it's amazing thing that, that happens is that once they have this empowerment and realize they can make amazing things, they naturally want to use that power to go out and make a difference in the world in various ways. And there's lots of examples from the global maker community of people gaining these skills, learning how to um, create new things and then using it to better the world. One uh, example is it's called Project Enable, and it's a nonprofit organization, and they uh, provide free open source models of 3D printed printable ha uh, prosthetic hands. And it was actually developed by a guy called Ivan Owen in 2011, and he developed this uh, hand that could retract using levers for a cosplay, for a steampunk cosplay. And, but then it became clear that it was actually something that could be really beneficial to people who are in need of prosthetic hands. So uh, he's, this is now a, a, a nonprofit organization and he provides uh, these files and a lot of other people have gone and tinkered with them and made improvements and things like that. But it's really great, especially for like, um, younger kids that grow really quickly and would need replacement prosthetics like pretty often. Um, it's something that you can easily resize and print out again. And I think what Project Enable does now is basically connect people who have the capability to print these out with people who might need them in their area. So amazing project that just came out of, again, this maker mindset of like, I made this thing, how can it help other people? And then I have another, I have this, this example that is very close to my heart. Um, so my department head here is a kitten fosterer and she's fostered hundreds of kittens at this point. And um, last year around this time, she brought in these three baby kittens. This one here, his name was Cheez-It. And he, um, he came, into the office with his two little brothers, but he's about a week old here and needed to be bottle fed a lot. So Carla brought him into the office and um, he had unfortunately uh, an issue with his back legs. And it's something that sometimes happens with small kittens where their legs, uh, their tendons uh, contract so they can't actually use their legs. And the traditional treatment for this is basically hobbling together like popsicle sticks or other little um, implements that you could find. And they need their, their legs to be braced in order for them to grow properly. But as long as they can have that brace at an early age, they, 
they will develop totally normally and have a normal life. So, um, but Carla's vet had basically just said, we just have to like, you know, put something together that'll hold the legs straight. Well, our student worker, Clayton, who's um, here on the right, he uh, has graduated, he graduated last year, but he was a mechanical engineering major and always just, he was always just making stuff in the space, like tinkering around and playing around with things. And he was here when we were kind of all holding the baby kittens and heard about this, uh, a Cheez-Its leg issue and he immediately was like oh I can make something for that so um, you can see him here with his like measuring tools and a piece of paper and he basically traced little cheese its leg and measured and honestly within like an hour he had modeled a little brace with a hinge in it that mm -hmm. could be sized to fit any kitten and so Carla took this to her vet and they were ecstatic because uh, they're just, they didn't have anything like this that could be used. So Clayton actually made it available as an open source 3D model that any vet can use, um, either find a local 3D printer, send it off or, um, or whatever, find a way to make it. And um, so, so this could potentially go on to help you know, hundreds or thousands of other little kittens who have the same problem. Uh, and it, I just think it's an example of, I truly believe that people are good, that people want to help others. And when you develop these skills, you just automatically will see problems in the world that might need solving and uh, go out there and do it. So that's one of my favorite examples of that idea of civic mindedness. That is awesome. Beautiful. I know, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> makes me want to cry. Anyway, uh, okay, so now I want to talk about metacognition. This is the fourth kind of um, concept within meta literacy that I'm going to discuss. And it's just basically awareness of your own thought processes, which sounds super uh, basic, but it's actually a really great way for students to learn. And in the classroom, this kind of looks like, uh, you know, reflecting, thinking back on what they've learned, journaling, you know, just, um, just really making sure they're understanding where their thought process is at any given time. And although, most literature on maker literacy doesn't specifically mention metacognition as kind of part of the process or an outcome. Uh, I actually argue that metacognition is foundational to maker learning. And uh, Wallace uh, from the Maker Literacies Project actually pointed out that uh, adding self-reflective components to maker projects uh, like journaling or a discussion, it actually led to observable student growth. So it's, um, I, I believe that's that's just metacognition, right? Um, so I constantly am inserting kind of reflective metacognition into my courses. I like to borrow this activity from Agency by Design. It's called the Memorable Making Experience. It's very simple. It's you just ask students to reflect on a memorable making experience that they've had in their lives. And I make sure to remind students that making is like super wide and inclusive. It doesn't have to be what you would maybe normally traditionally associate with making like 3D printing. It could be baking a cake, fixing a car, drawing a picture, anything where you've used your creativity, your problem solving skills, and you've made something, whether it's physical or digital. So the purpose of this self-reflective activity, it's kind of twofold. Number one, it really helps students frame the act of making in a broad sense. And especially for students who are in the makerspace for the first time, it shows them that everyone is a maker in some way, shape or form, whether they really thought of themselves that way before or not. And it helps them feel like they belong in the space. Um, so that's really great, but it also prompts students to engage in metacognition. They're reflecting on their own experiences and it's valuable because it helps students kind of relate their personal experiences to the makerspace lesson that we're doing and it helps them understand how their own personal experiences relate to developing a maker mindset. So that's all meta literacy and how I think that maker literacy fits in. 
Now I'm going to talk about this idea of liminality. This is going to get really theoretical for a second, but I promise I'll make it make sense. <laughs> so um, liminality, I actually love this concept. and I'm kind of a nerd about it. But anyway, um, so this is a term that was first coined by anthropologist Arnold Van Gennep in 1908. And then it was actually taken up by another anthropologist called Victor Turner in the 1960s. So in anthropology, when someone is in a state of liminality, they're basically between states of being. And Turner uh, defines this as, quote, transitioning from one social identity to another, such as child to adult, from citizen to king, or from living body to dead corpse. So got a little dark there, but I think it kind of shows the, that's what they see it as. It's a transition. You're in that liminal space. And it's, this concept of liminality has gone beyond anthropology anthropology, and we find it in other disciplines like performance studies, religious studies, literature, popular culture, and it's kind of interpreted slightly differently in each area of study, but generally it, re it represents this in-between. So in between of identities, of understandings, of states of being, or of space, like literal space. And then Meyer and Land in 2003 discussed liminality as it applies to higher education learning theory using threshold concepts. And threshold concepts are a big part of the ACRL framework, but they are, quote, irreversible and transformative learning events that are integral to students' understanding of a particular subject. Uh, so it's this... Uh, this idea that they move through a liminal space and then they get to the other side. And that threshold, crossing that threshold, actually um, not only furthers their learning, but it kind of cements the um, things that they've learned in their mind. So during that liminal space though, they might feel a little anxiety. They might feel sometimes like they're a little bit stuck. Um, and Threshold concepts can be kind of structured by the instructor and like more, you know, like predetermined, but liminality offers less predictability. It's kind of this liquid space that we put students into. And um, Barbara Pfister, um, who uh, worked on the ACRL framework, she applies this idea of liminality directly to the framework. And she points out that, um, you know, information literacy is kind of the active process of acquiring experience, skills, and dispositions. And I love this quote from her about liminality. So I'm just going to read the whole quote out. Uh, the place where we, she calls it, the place where we are between understandings. It's the borderland we're passing through as we move from a familiar place to an unknown place. It's where we're unsettled, where we might turn back because it's just too uncomfortable, or where we might feel exhilarated by the challenge. So I absolutely love that quote. And um, I assert that maker-centered learning in a lot of ways lives in that liminal space. Uh, we intentionally sometimes position our students just a little bit outside of their comfort zone while simultaneously providing support because we don't want them to feel alienated. And I, I do want everyone to feel included um, and, you know, like they're part of the community here. But what I mean in terms of pushing them a little bit outside of their comfort zone is like we're not having everybody come in and make the exact same thing. We're kind of allowing uncertainty, improvisation, and also failures in the learning process. So it kind of, um, I keep activities extremely open-ended and I let students take projects in whatever direction they want. And a lot of times that can be a little bit scary for students because, uh, you know, a lot of times in traditional educational settings, students are just told do this thing, you know, and they do the thing. Um, so there's a little bit of more uncertainty in the maker learning classroom and they kind of have to tinker and figure things out on their, their own. In other words, they're in that liminal state and it allows them to be more creative, they develop critical thinking skills, and they eventually develop that maker mindset. So, um, oh, go ahead. That kind of reminds me of like the, the stages that people prog like progress through to go from standard employee over to creating your own business, because you actually pass through a bunch of different liminal states. Absolutely. And like organizations can cultivate environments that can like trap people in limit like in like one state or the other, or they can cultivate like the 
helping people grow agency and like shift. Oh, so I love that. Employee, get like instructions, do as you're told, then become like an entrepreneur, get agency in the workplace and start shaping your environment and then shift over to maybe having your own department and then shift over to maybe even starting your own business yeah. and be able to solve the problem well enough to be able to create something new. So that's Absolutely. what I'm reminded me of. That's such a good point. I love that like real world example of how, yeah, like in order to achieve most good things in life, you do have to go through some kind of liminal state, right? Even if you're just moving from one job to another, there's always that like uncertain middle time, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, and it can be really scary, but it can be really transformational too. So I, right. we should talk more at some point, Amanda, about this concept because I love the idea of liminality so much and um, right. I just think there's so many applications of it, so. So it's cool. everywhere and you didn't even know it. That's right, <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, the culmination of all this, I know this is kind of like a theory heavy presentation, but um, what I've done is I've used all of this to create some student learning outcomes for each frame of the ACRL framework. And um, they're all maker-centered learning. And for each frame I've created, foundational, emerging, and culminating outcomes. And um, I will say that sometimes anybody who does library instruction, or even if you teach workshops or, you know, any kind of teaching, it is difficult in a lot of these settings to get to the, like emerging and culminating outcomes because either you have one hour and a half workshop that you're doing with people, or you have, um, in my case, like maybe a class will just come see the makerspace once and I only have one class period with them. Um, so it is a challenge kind of moving up that ladder. And I've really tried to uh, work with faculty to help explain to them how if I can be more embedded in their course and if they can visit me multiple times throughout the semester, their students are going to develop these higher level um, skills and, uh, you know, achieve these higher level learning outcomes. But of course, it's never perfect. So sometimes I just do get one hour with the class and we just do the best we can. But I really love having the learning outcomes because for each request I get from an instructor, I can create a specific lesson plan to them, but then I have these learning outcomes that I can refer to. So this is an example. And again, on the slides is the link and you can see all the learning outcomes. And I'll also say that these are always in development. <laughs> like I feel like I'm always adjusting these. So, um, and I love feedback too. So if you are interested in going and checking out these learning outcomes and, and you wanna provide me any feedback, that'd be awesome. So this one is for the frame authority is constructed and contextual. So for foundational, really we're just showing students that information can come from diverse voices, especially in a makerspace environment, and that authority is distributed. So whenever um, I am teaching, I am never like, sage on the stage like I generally don't try to lecture very much um, I try to have us all learn together and like my catchphrase is very much like I'm not sure but let's figure that out together <laughs> like I I'm not the expert I can help guide students and I facilitate learning but um, a lot of times I learn from the students or students learn from other students so that authority is really distributed and um, so that's something that I can get across even in just a, a single session and I think that's really helpful for students because the way that authoritative information sources work in a makerspace is very different from traditional library research. And I think a lot of times students are used to coming to the library to get those traditional information literacy kind of instructional sessions. And um, it's different in makerspaces. So if we look at the emerging, uh, the students are developing skills to organically evaluate information sources, and that's through hands-on experimentation and iteration. So they're, they're finding resources they're learning things either in the classroom or from online resources, but they're really testing the authority of those sources through that hands-on experimentation. And then, um, yeah, we're talking about how information doesn't always come from traditional authoritative voices, 
So, um, and then if we go to culminating, I've actually just copied and pasted a, a learning outcome from my library's um, information literacy student learning outcomes, but it's that students recognize that authority is contextual in relation to time, discipline, methodology, and other factions or other factors. And um, traditional notions of granting authority could hinder diverse ideas or worldviews. I think that's actually like super applicable in maker spaces as well. And then the final culminating outcome is that students gain this confidence in their own authority to evaluate objects and information sources. So to figure out how to fix a problem with a maker project, a lot of times you're not going to be looking at a like traditional research article. Um, most of the time you're going to be relying on kind of less formal information sources, like maybe it's YouTube or Instructables or, you know, just whatever you can find out there. And so students have to kind of then become their own authority to determine whether that information is valuable or not. Um, and then eventually create their own information and create their own uh, guides and, and tools that other people can use. So that's just one example of some of the student learning outcomes. Again, take a look if you're interested. I can okay. see how, going back to that previous slide, I can see how you mentioned in the beginning that this, you, you know, you're obviously doing this presentation and all of this from the point of an academic library. Um, but there are, yes, lots of, of so many public libraries have been maker spaces. Um, absolutely, we have we did a grant project where we put it in, into like 30 libraries, and there's more of them happening all the time that we're helping out. That's amazing. Um, and and it's like what you said. Also, we know we've got all the information about what this stuff, what the equipment can do, but then why are we using it? What's the whole, you know, what's gonna what's gonna come of that? And yeah. this, I can totally see this being something, even though this is coming from. Um, ACRL and academic side that a public library could use for justification of why they want to do this. Just totally all the same things like, you know, we're, are we we're just having fun playing with 3D printers? What the heck? We're making some buttons for what reason? Um, for fun? No, there's actual thing. This is more concrete, you know, yeah. wording that I think public libraries could definitely take this and use this um, in their you know, going to stakeholders or their directors or whoever or their boards and saying, hey, this is what will come of this. We're not just doing 3D printers because they're the new buzzword. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's more, much more behind this that yeah, will come Yeah. And I actually, uh, you know, that goes back to my kind of previous point of like, how do we stay relevant and keep our stakeholders, our administration supportive of what we're doing? And um, yeah, definitely in all types of maker spaces, uh, we have to show the the why, right? Like the um, yeah, the, services that the we provide. Why, why are we doing it? Why are we putting the money and the effort into it? Well. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's a lot of, um, you can achieve a lot of this through, you know, in, in public library maker spaces as well. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I hope it's transferable for sure. I okay. okay um, yeah. I, okay, I just want to make sure I wasn't running completely out of time, but <laughs> please good. just cut me off if we get um, too close to the to the end. No, it's no um, problem. We'll go as long as it takes um, for you to get through okay. everything you need to. And if anyone does have any questions, just a reminder, anybody has any questions, comments, anything you want to say? Oh, and of course, something just popped up while I was saying that. Let's see what we got here. Um, um, oh, wow, there's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> and um, maybe I'll hold this to the end after you finish wrapping up because it's not specific. Okay. About what about here. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, we'll cool. definitely ask um, both Sarah and Amanda to answer this question. But cool. go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to share a few examples of classes that I've worked with to kind of bring it home and show how I've actually used these concepts in practice. This is a Latin American class, um, Latin American studies called Latin American Diaspora in the US. The instructor is Juan Carlos Alboron. And he came to me kind of not exactly sure what he wanted to do, but he did want to incorporate the makerspace somehow in this class. And his goal with this class, he said, um, I have mostly white students and I want them to empathize and understand the experiences of Latin American folks um, and kind of get outside of their own personal experiences a little bit. So when he said empathize, I immediately thought of the design thinking process 
So design thinking is a human-centered design process based on empathy. And it does come out of the corporate world in product design. And the, the idea is that you can't design like useful products for people unless you understand those people's needs on a deep level. You can't just assume what people need and make something because it's not going to be beneficial. So the design thinking process has this um, has empathy built into it and there's a bunch of different ways that you can achieve that empathy. So I thought like let's take the design thinking process and kind of flip the script a little bit so that we're just using that empathy aspect to better understand um, experiences outside of, of students own experiences. So we I had them do empathy interviews in the class. Uh, they came to me for in the first part of the semester and we talked about assumptions. What assumptions do you have going into this process before you actually even um, practice empathy and um, and talk to people um, of Latin American descent? And uh, so they did that. We did a, an assumptions exercise where they kind of like sketched out some assumptions that they had. Then they went and they did their empathy interviews and they came back to me a month or two later at the later part of the semester. and we compared what they had assumed versus the actual insights that they gained through empathy. And then we took those insights and we talked a little bit about visual rhetoric and representing ideas visually, and they created a logo and then turned that into a button. So um, in this process, there was metacognition. There was a lot of reflecting, like reflecting on their own assumptions, reflecting on um, you know, what actually they learned through that empathy. There's empowerment, there's definitely civic mindedness because it's increasing students' empathy uh, towards folks who have different experiences, backgrounds um, than their own. And these are the actual buttons that they made. Um, so I had them choose one to three words, a uh, an image, an icon of some kind, and then colors. And the colors had to hold meaning and they had to um, express why the colors held that meaning. And we, you know, we had some really great discussions, but it was a really cool way for them to express their ideas um, visually and using their hands. So that's uh, one of my favorite classes I've done. I'm working with that instructor again this semester, so I'm sure we'll refine things a little bit. Um, I've worked with this UNV 101 class, and UNV 101 at Miami is basically intro to university. It's for first year students, specifically this class is for first year undecided students, and it's their first semester at college. They are learning all the stuff they need to be successful in college, but they're also trying to figure out what direction they want to go in. So they do a lot of self-reflection. They do a lot of, like, um, you know, personality assessment stuff and learning about different fields and where they might like to go. So this professor came to me um, wanting to have students explore their identities a little bit through maker projects. So this is the first iteration of this class where uh, students came in right at the beginning of the semester, the first week, and they did this first exercise called Who I Am Not. And they were asked to, um, first they, they carved a Miami M out of this block of wood on our CNC machine to kind of represent their beginning of their Miami experience. And then they had to choose three words that represented who they are not, which meant things that other people assume about them based on how they look, how they talk, where they're from, whatever. And they cut those words out of um, vinyl and put it on the back of the wood block. So it was kind of like this, I don't know, um, symbolic way for them to represent kind of, this is what I'm working against. And then um, throughout the semester, like I was saying, they did a lot of like, you know, self-reflection and figuring, honestly, they're really figuring out who they are because they, they want to figure out which direction their career will go in, which direction their studies will go in. So they came back near the end of the semester and we did this project called Who I Am. And they actually had to design a personal logo using three words and some kind of icon. And they made uh, stickers <laughs> out of their logos. So it was just a way for them to really use metacognition as a tool for self-discovery. And then they came back 
uh, the next year with a well, different group of kids, same instructor. And instead of doing the sticker, we ended up doing these vision boards on cork board. And they had to um, represent themselves, their goals, their hopes. And it's a really fun way for them to brainstorm and what direction they want to go and then set these goals for themselves and then they can actually put it on their wall in their dorm room and keep a reminder of what they want to achieve and what they want to do so um, and then one last class I'll talk about this one was called short forms of the Mexican Revolution and it uh, was all about the print and photography technology of the Mexican Revolution and how it impacted tech or uh, politics of the time and specifically the technology was printing presses and halftone photography. And so I found a, a, a website, it's called the Open Press Project, and they have freely downloadable um, designs for 3D printed printing presses. So we actually 3D printed a bunch of these little mini printing presses. They're like about yay big. And we had students do intaglio printing, which generally would be traditionally would be like a copper plate that you scratch and then you ink and then you print through the printing press. But we actually use the inside of juice boxes and because um, juice boxes have that like aluminum kind of little coating on the inside mm -hmm. and they scratched out their design, inked it and then put it through the printing press. And then I also taught them about half tone photography, which is essentially taking an image and turning it into a series of dots. And it was how photographs were able to be printed in newsprint for the first time. Uh, so we, I showed them how to actually um, turn an image into halftone in Photoshop, and then we la laser etched the images. So the whole point of this was to help students better understand this technology by actually getting their hands dirty and using it. And it's so much more uh, impactful, I think, than like reading about a technology or seeing pictures of it. Uh, so it was really fun for students to, they actually visited special collections that same day and looked at some primary sources from um, the Mexican Revolution. And then they came in here and actually made things themselves on the little printing presses and the laser cutter. So. Um, it was, yeah, and I, I called it empowerment through hands-on tinkering and exploring different technologies. Uh, and I think that was my last, yeah, that was my last example. Yeah, so cool. <laughs> this is my shameless plug for my book. Uh, oh. <laughs> if anybody's interested in um, anything related to um, experiential learning, new technologies in academic libraries. There it is. And this is my contact information. I welcome emails, uh, connect with me on Twitter. I don't go on Twitter as much anymore, but it is still there and um, good way to connect if you're interested. So yeah, now I'm happy to answer questions. Awesome, okay, all right. Um, go ahead and leave that slide up um, while we're um, getting our questions or anything and finishing up here. Um, yeah, if anyone does have any questions, comments, thoughts, uh, type in the question section. Um, yeah, it is 11.01 um, Central Time here, but uh, we are not getting cut off because it, that is, we um, will go as long as it takes for anyone to have their questions answered, anything they want to share, anything you've done in your libraries that maybe relates to what Sarah's talking about today, um, please share with us. Um, and I'll also put in the plug that... Um... Sarah and I are also working on kind of a project to put together makerspace instructions and kind of guidebooks and resources. Nice. So if anyone wants to help contribute resources or help join a team to help shape out with it, what a resource portal would look like, mm -hmm. you're welcome to join us. Please contact them. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be a really exciting project and really impactful for a lot of makerspaces. So yeah, all types of makerspaces because they're in like we talked about academic, public. Um, K-12 schools too um, mm -hmm. have their maker spaces as well for the um, the teens and the kids there. So yeah. Um, so the one question that came in earlier that I said is a, a big question, but for both, and I'll have both um, Sarah and Amanda, both of you answer this. Um, in terms of staying relevant, do you have any idea of what the future trends of maker spaces will be? Um, future trends of maker space. <laughs> I, I'll go ahead and I'll jump in. 
I think you... that um, the future of maker spaces is going to trend more towards um, the educational opportunities available through maker spaces. Uh, so at this time, I um, I think that the newer technology is going to be things like VR and AR and finding ways to um, implement that into maker spaces in meaningful ways for um, people of all ages and all types of students. So I think that technology is going to continue to grow. 3D printer technology is continuing to um, advance. And I think 3D printing is going to be more uh, feasible as a as a manufacturing process. So I see um, you know, students learning 3D printing as job skills in public libraries or academic libraries. And I know I mentioned earlier that it's not all about learning specific technology, but it is a nice byproduct, um, especially as 3D printing, we're seeing it in all different industries. Like your dentist might have a 3D printer now. Your, you know, like a, a car, a, a auto shop might have a 3D printer. Like it's just, beneficial in so many different areas. So I don't know. Yeah, that's what I'm feeling in terms of technology, VR and AR. Um, and then also uh, another thing is the growth of these AI apps for um, creating art, images, text. Um, I think we're going to be seeing that more and more as a theme that comes up in terms of technology and libraries and um, how we incorporate that into creativity. I actually want to do a workshop or an event of some kind in my makerspace where we have students do AI art, experiment with AI art, and then turn it into something else maybe. So I'm not exactly sure what form that'll take, but that's what comes to mind immediately when I think about the future. Um, what do you Night think, Amanda? Cafe. Night Cafe is one of my favorite AI art generation apps. And oh, it's also... Right they have a freemium option and a pro option. And you okay. can also claim five free credits every day. So I've been stockpiling free credits for different programming options. Oh, sweet. <laughs> awesome. Night Cafe. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I've never heard of that one, so thanks. It makes both weird and awesome stuff. <laughs> yeah. AI art is, that's a perfect description. Yeah. It's weird and awesome. It, it, yeah. yeah. And I guess my answer to that question would be if you're looking specific for specific technology types, just Google Industry 4.0 or Digital Fabrication Technologies. Mm -hmm. And that'll encompass everything from artificial intelligence to Internet of Things that covers your sensors, network devices. Um, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, the metaverse, pretty much everything. But it's less about, as Sarah was saying, I think it's less about the technology and more about finding better ways to understand personal and community problems. So Clayton M. Christensen, he's also out of the business corporate world and he uses the jobs to be done approach. So he finds different user experience research techni techniques to understand what are the problems that actually drive people to action. When you understand the problems that drive people to action, you can better connect people with technology tools that solve them. Because like, I know that Sarah and I have talked about this before, but there's like a billion and one libraries that keep trying to do laser cutting t classes, but then people go to the training class and never show up. But then the question that I have is, what problem does laser cutting solve in their lives? Why would they take the time to learn a tool if it's not applicable to their life? Mm -hmm. If they just went and like, if they just printed off some garden stakes for their garden, cool. That may have solved the problem of being bored for about an hour or two. And they might have solved the problem of being curious about a new technology. But unless they're also using that to prototype a new desk stand or a monitor stand like why why do they need it mm -hmm. so mapping out those different problems I think is the future trend of maker spaces because if you don't have the relevant problems you don't have the relevant technology and you don't have the right marketing techniques to connect the two yep that is yeah, such a good 
thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Krista. You have to have a plan or a policy, something yeah. you can't just, like I said, maker spaces and all of these things are big buzzwords and lots of people are jumping on on board with it. But right. yeah. you have to have a plan and a, and a why and what yeah, makes it sure. relevant. Like I mean, you both said, I mean, we keep repeating, but it's it's so important. Yeah. Too many places, I think, and this has happened with all sorts of technology, new social media things. Um, so many organizations or people just jump on board and then they don't know what to do with it. And then they're floundering. Like, well, why isn't anybody following us on our Instagram or on our, um, you know, Snapchat or, or TikTok? Well, what was your plan? Well, right. yeah. is doing it? so we needed to have one. No, no, that's not, that's not going to help. That's not going to work. No. But the bandwagon was right there. Yeah. It was so easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that's a mistake a lot of libraries make is they grab all, they get the equipment because um, maybe they got some, you know, sometimes your administration is like, here's some money <laughs> and you're like, cool. Yeah. So you, yeah. you buy the equipment before knowing what your purpose is. And yeah, I wrote down that like, like what problem is this technology solving in their lives? That is like, that's the, you're right. That is the core question that needs to be answered, not only so that we can justify having maker spaces in libraries, but that's how we get people to connect. Like that's honestly what my students come in for. It's solving a problem for them, whether it's they have to do this for a class assignment or they have a passion project they want to work on or yeah, like literally they're, they're doing something functional that will, you know, solve a problem. But anyway, there's, I, there's, a, there's a kitten that needs help. That's a, that's right. a, that's yeah, like, a little baby but, cheese it. <laughs> I'll tell you my like dream. This my other dream for that repository is to also have a library of problems that people can click on and it shoots over to like connect to the examples of technologies and like a little activity or lesson plan that does something with it. Mm -hmm. I love that library of problems. That could even be something that you could have in your, you could have, um, you could connect with local organizations, people in yeah. need, yeah. and you could have people who literally put out a call, like, I need this. I need somebody right. to connect with me and help me make this. And then people, because one thing I get from students who like love the makerspace, but they don't take the time to come in as much is they're like, well, I don't have a project and actually coming up with a project is like a big part of half the of process. It, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, so, it, you know, I, that's actually a really good idea is like having, um, having problems that people can solve and literally help other people directly. That could be really right. cool. I love that library of problems. I wrote that down too. <laughs> Maybe we can add that to the repository. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And again, we're also recruiting people. So email. <laughs> Join oh. us. Yes. Contact <laughs> <Twitter>. Contact <laughs> Amanda where it's a commission. Yeah. Absolutely. Library of problems. All right. Um, it doesn't look like anybody else had any other desperate questions or comments that they typed in while we were chatting here. Uh, that's okay. If you all do have any questions you want to ask of Sarah, there's your contact info, or if you want to reach out to Amanda here at the Library Commission, you can do that as well. Um, so I think I will do my uh, wrap up here. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us on Amanda's uh, pre-suite tech day here. Uh, this was a great presentation. As I said, you know, you are coming from the academic side, but this is something totally that public and school libraries actually yeah. could do. Yeah. Anybody who's got a makerspace, everything in here is is totally applicable to just if you got a makerspace in your in your institution, use this information <laughs> for it. So um, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for being here. I'm gonna pull back presenter control to my screen now to do my there we go, my wrap up for the show. So that uh, wraps up for today's show. I'm going to go to my main Encompass Live page here. Um, if you use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, the name of our show, we're the only thing called that on the internet so far. Nobody else is allowed to use that name. <laughs> um, then you'll get our page here. These are our upcoming shows, but the archive shows are here um, right underneath. There's a link to our archives. Most recent one at the top of the page here. So today's show will be there. Should be done as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know that it's available. Uh, we also post out to our social 
Uh, we have a Facebook page for the show. If you use Facebook, if you like to use Facebook for Encompass Live, give us a like. You can see as a reminder about today's show, announcement of recordings. Um, we use the hashtag Encump Live for Encompass Live and Pretty Sweet Tech when it's a Pretty Sweet Tech show. So you can also follow those hashtags on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, and we'll have a link to the recording and um, Sarah will send to me the link to your slides and that will have a link um, to that as well on the session page for today's show. Uh, while we're here in the archives, I'll show you there is a search feature if you wanna look for topics, see if we've done a show on anything you might be interested in. You can search the full show archives or just most recent 12 months if you like. Uh, that is because this is the full archives and I'm not gonna scroll all the way down because it's huge, as you can see here, uh, from when starting going back, going back all the way to when Encompass Live premiered, which was January, 2009. So we are in our 15th year of Encompass Live. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and they're all here. As long as you have a place to host them, the recordings are out there. But do be aware, you know, a lot of old information here. Some sessions will stand the test of time and still be great to watch. Some will become old, outdated. Resources or information may have changed drastically. Some resources might not exist anymore. People might work at different libraries now. So just be aware of the original broadcast date. It's on every session so you know when it was first um, uh, done, that show. Um, so uh, I want to invite you to attend our upcoming shows. Next week, we're talking about uh, Nebraska's One Book, One Nebraska title, The Mystery of Hunting's End. That's our title for the upcoming year. So we will be talking about that and how you can promote that and use that in your library. Uh, so please do sign up for that and our other upcoming shows. I do have other March dates that I'm just waiting on finalization, you know, confirmation on. So keep an eye on here for as, as more dates get filled in. Um, and then we'll see whatever Amanda's topic might be for March. I don't know if she has any thoughts. I always put her on the spot like this, but <laughs> don't have to know now. We'll find out. I'll find and, something. <laughs> yeah, there's always something to come up with, yeah. <laughs> and the last thing I just want to mention is, in addition to this weekly show, Encompass Live, that we host here through the Library Commission, we also have the Big Talk from Small Libraries online conference. Uh, we do this in con um, connection with the Association for Rural and Small Libraries, National Organization for Rural and Small Libraries. And this is an online conference, always the last Friday in February, where all of the presenters are from libraries with an FTE or population served of 10,000 or less. That's our definition of small libraries. And it is in two days. It's this Friday. Oh my gosh, I'm almost ready. <laughs> I run and host the whole... <laughs> That crept up this year. It, yeah, it does sometimes when the, you know, February is a weird short month and you never know. Um, so it is in two days. Registration is still open. Um, you can pre-register through the end of the day uh, tomorrow, Thursday. But even after that, if you don't get pre-registered, we post the login link right here on the um, um, conference page. Um, so please do sign up. It's not just for small libraries to watch. It's for anybody. Um, it's free. It's open to anyone across the country, across the world, whoever wants to join us. Uh, the whole day is recorded. If you're unable to join us on Friday, that's okay. We have our other previous conferences here. We started in a big talk in 2012 with ARSL. So um, please do sign up and join us and see what your uh, colleagues in the sm small libraries are doing. Um, the schedule is up. The speaker information is there so you can see what we'll be talking about on Friday. So that will be my day on Friday. So oh, thank you everybody for being here with us. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Amanda. And thanks I hope for having me. Yeah, thank you. This is a great session. I'm very excited. <laughs> and I hope we will see um, everyone at a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. There we go. And a recording stopped. Cool.